so you're saying all defined objects can be explained by, or you know, are defined, composed of something, and there's not something that they all have in common. Okay, how would this work? Uh, would it be what? Say here, here, let's say we have this circle here, right? And in this circle are all defined things in existence, right? And it, and since we're rejecting the infinite, anything outside the circle doesn't exist. Right? Everything that inside the circle is what's is not only what exists, but it's all defined objects. So we say that not all defined objects have something in common, but there's always something that does that does the job of, of defining those. Like okay, well. Huh. Uh, how would this work? Well, well, suppose we say we have this object X, this kind of thing X, and X's are composed of Y's. Okay, so far so good. Uh, but we can't say that everything has Y in common, right? We got X's that are composed of Y's, but we can't say everything has Y in common. So Y has to have something else, right? That it has. Well, maybe it's Z, right? So Z's, uh, you know, is what composes or does the job for X. Uh, but, you know, we can't say everything is, you know, Z because it, it's that, you know, not everything, you know, not everything has something in common. Well, then, so Z's are composed of X's. And, and now you have everything is defined or composed by something, but there's not one thing that composes all other things because X's are composed of Y's and Y's are composed of Z's and Z's are composed of X's. Is that going to do it? Probably not. <laughs> that it, 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 at the very least, trying to explain that or, or make coherent sense of that will be difficult. Will be difficult. So, uh, well, let's scratch that one. Let's try something else. Suppose again, we have our circle here with all defined things. Well, we, we have uh, our defined objects, right, X's, and they're composed of Y's. But we don't want to say that there's one thing that they all have. So it has to be composed of something else. Well, maybe it's Z's. And then those are composed of something else, whatever you want to call it. Maybe call them A's. <laughs> and they go, those are composed of B's. And those are composed. So the idea is that there's this infinite regression down of composition. I, I suppose you can go that way, right? Because then what do we say? Well, we got all these objects here around us, and they're all composed of atoms. And atoms are composed of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And protons, neutrons, and electrons are composed of quarks. And quarks are composed of strings. And strings are composed of bits. And bits are composed of bops. And bops are composed of gurps. And gurps are composed of dips. And you just keep going on down in infinite regress. So then that means that for any given object, you have an infinite number of objects? I mean, I suppose you could do that if you like. <laughs> Uh, but again, that, you know, uh, that, that would be a very difficult pill to swallow. I mean, you could try to do this, I suppose, at least in a variety of different ways. But however way you do it, since you're saying that there's not something that everything has in common, you have now just given up on Thales' project to begin with. Right? Thales started out this whole project, which Anaximander Man is trying to respond to, by saying everything around us has some kind of commonality. And if you give up on Thales' project, you give up on the main motivation behind contemporary physics, behind our understanding of what it means to comprehend all this. I mean, physicists are act actively after what's called the theory of everything, right? this commonality for all things. So if you, if you go this way, if you reject this premise and you're committed to, to it's contradictory, you have now rejected the basic motivation behind uh, contemporary physics. All right, so we've got this, we're dealing with this commitment here. Right? There's something that all defined objects have in common. So all these, all these things has one thing in common, and it is one of these defined things. Wow, okay. Well, uh, how would this work, right? This is what Anaximander tried to do to begin with. This is part of his thought experiment, was how to make, even try to make sense of this. So we, what do we say today? We say, well, all these are composed of atoms. 
And experimenter says, great, what are atoms? And then we say, well, you know, they're, they're protons, they're composed of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And experimenter says, okay, great. What are protons, neutrons, and electrons? It's like, well, okay, a, a proton is a positively charged particle, an electron is a negatively charged particle, a neutron is a particle but no charge. <laughs> and experimenter says, okay, but you're, you're, you're getting more and more kinds of things now, aren't you? Uh, and by the way, what is it? So now we've got a charge and a particle, and you know, a particle of what? Is that a particle of sand? Particle of water? What, what's it a particle of? Well, it's a particle. That doesn't help. A particle of what? You know, we keep going. I mean, this is where I lose a little bit of my grasp of particle physics, but I believe the next step down is quarks. And there's something like 23 different kinds of quarks, something like that. And then oh, and the next minute says, okay, cool. I've never heard of a quark, but sure, fine. Uh, what's a quark? <laughs> you kind of get the feeling here that Annex Manor's like, I don't know, I think you're just making up names at this point. <laughs> well, then the next step down, I believe, from quarks uh, is strings. So strings are one-dimensional objects looped in four dimensions of space, depending on how they vibrate. You get different kinds of quarks depending on your different combinations of quarks or different kinds of quarks. You get your protons, neutrons, and electrons. Depending on your protons, neutrons, and electrons, you get different kinds of atoms. Depending on the different kinds of atoms, you get uh, different substances. Depending on your com uh, co combination of substances, right? you get these different objects. Anderson Anderson says, great. A string of what? Is it cotton? <laughs> and, and really, you know, when we say one-dimensional string, that means that it has no width. It only has length, which as far as I know, only happens in a geometry textbook, right? <laughs> it's, you know, a one-dimensional string is what, a direction? Is that what that is? Uh, <laughs> so, you know, you start breaking this down more and more, and Annex Manor says, I don't even know what this is anymore. I don't know what a one-dimensional object is, and I don't think you really do either. And, and really trying to explain it takes quite a bit of work. Yeah. But you suppose you just suppose you make sense of strings, it's like, cool, strings of what? Points? <laughs> uh, are there segments to strings? Are there threads of string? Threads of what? Because we've left behind this stuff a long time ago. But you keep, you keep going down. Whatever name you want to come up with. We've got strings, we've got gerbobbles. We've got gerbobbles, we've got kerplixits. We've got kerplixits, we've got goobles. And just keep going down. Uh, smaller and smaller. I mean, really, you keep this up, you're going to wind up with points, right? Not one-dimensional object, but zero-dimensional objects. To which Annex Man is going to say, great, points of what? <laughs> so, taking this approach it has, has some real difficulties. I mean, either, right, you are defining these things in terms of two other things, right? Pro, uh, atoms are composed of protons, neutrons, electrons. We've got three kinds of things now. Quarks, I think it's again like 23. Strings, lots of different kinds of strings depending upon the vibration. Uh, so you can define in terms of at least two other things. With that, there goes the unity, right? Because all this is supposed to be unified by one thing according to Thales, right? This is the whole insight that Thales started with. Or you just, you know, you know say, well, it's a quark, and a quark is a string, and a string is, you just start infinitely regressing on down, right? And, and then either that thing, either you stop at some point and say, well, it's, it's a, a Google. What's a Google? It has no definition. Oh, come on. I don't even know what that is, and neither do you. By your own description, it has no definition. Or you keep trying to define, right? You keep <laughs> defining all the way down. And yeah, uh, neither approach really does much of anything. So I, I suppose you could try this, but either you're never going to finish or it's going to end in something that you can't tell us what it is. And neither result sounds very good.
So we're saying there's something that is not one of the defined objects and that thing has boundaries or definitions. Well, how's that supposed to work? I mean, so here's, say we have this circle here, right? And inside the circle, this represents all defined things. And since we are rejecting Annex Amanda's conclusion, anything outside the circle doesn't exist. Uh, we're saying the only thing that exists is, is, is defined stuff. Right? Okay, cool. Uh, but there's something that is not one of the defined things. So it's outside the circle. It's not defined. But it also has boundaries or definition. Wait, how can something be both defined and not defined? Right? It can't. Right? This option, sometimes when you reject a proposition, it, it results in a logical contradiction, right? <laughs> or self-contradiction. And this is one of those cases. This is logically impossible. Something is both defined and not defined. Right? Uh, it both has uh, an attribute and it doesn't have the attribute. So with this option, this option results in a logical contradiction. Uh, you, you really just can't take this approach and still be rational. Okay, so we say, well, not all defined things can be explained. All right, or, or yeah. Okay. In other words, you just have to stop at some point. Well, I, I guess you can do that. <laughs> That's a choice. But then you, you're just kind of giving up at some point, I, I suppose. You say, well, you know, all this is atoms, and all atoms are composed of protons, neutrons, electrons, and eh, let's just stop there. <laughs> we don't need to go any further. We know there's positively charged particles, negatively charged particles, and particles with no charge. That's a proton, neutron, electron. Ah, eh, let's just stop there. <laughs> I, I, again, I suppose you can do that if you like, but again, you're, you're, you're basically stopping progress in the physical sciences. Like, eh, let's just stop. You're giving up on the project of the physical sciences. And since you, you likely decided to adopt, or excuse me, you likely decided to reject Annex and Manus conclusion because you're in favor of something like progress in the 21st century physics, that would be kind of strange. I believe in physics, but let's just go ahead and stop it here. That, that's probably a really bad idea. I mean, you could do it if you like, but it, it good luck justifying that one. So you're rejecting Annex of Menace's conclusion and going piece by piece through the premises. So the first stop you make is, or maybe <laughs> you're trying to say, well, there's something without boundaries or definition that explains all defined things and it's comprehensible. I'd like to see you try. <laughs> uh, we buy the very description of what you're given. It's out there. It has no boundaries. It's indefined. It's indefinable. But I get it. <laughs> really? That, that's a lot like saying you understand all numbers at once in their entirety. You perceive the entire number line. No, you don't. I mean, nobody does. Just try to picture the boundless. I mean, we've gone through this before. Try to picture the boundless. You're not picturing the boundless. You're picturing some defined thing, probably clouds or stars or something like that. Every bit of your knowledge, every last thing that you understand and can communicate has boundaries, has definition. Colors, numbers, objects, textures, feelings, thoughts. Every thought you have is finite and the number of th thoughts that you have is finite. Your head literally isn't big enough to contain the infinite. And we would barely have any words to describe limitlessness without using first a limited thing and then modifying it. So infinite, right? Got that N is the negation of finite. It's not finite. Right? Even if we try some assertion like length or vastness, ever vast, but you were still modifying a finite verb to describe it. We don't even have a, ver a single word that means in and of itself, this boundless sort of thing. At least not in English. So, uh, 
but even per the impossible, right? And I'm still going to say, you, if you think you understand the infinite um, and it has no boundaries of definition, right? even if you think you understand it, there's no way you can talk about it because it doesn't have boundaries of definitions. So that you can literally not describe it at all to anybody because every description you have is going to use a word that's well, finite. Right? And on top of that, the minute you start trying to describe it, you've given it boundaries or definition. So this option, I mean, you, you can try, I suppose, but probably not going to succeed. If you really want to go for this, fine. Notice this isn't so much, you know, I mean, if you really want to go for this, fine, but, you know, <laughs> I'm going to challenge you to tell me about it, and then you will immediately fail because in the attempt to tell me about it, you've given definition. Um, but not to mention the fact that in just simply going this path, we haven't rejected necessarily what Annex Menace has to say. This just is the assertion of the boundless and that it can do the job that it can do. Right? This is begging the question. It's assuming the conclusion against Annex Menace. It's not uh, proving anything against Annex Menace's conclusion. So it's got two severe problems. One, you probably can't comprehend the infinite. And the minute you try, right, it's no longer the infinite. And two, uh, you, you, this isn't evidence against An Anaximenes' conclusion, it's just the presumption against it. So you're trying to say that something is incomprehensible and yet it can explain. How? <laughs> or, you know, it, it's incomprehensible and it can define how. <laughs> I, I'm wondering what's going to do the job here. So it, I have figured it all out. I have figured out the answer to the question of what exists. Really? Wow. What is it? It's Kerplexit. Cool. What's Kerplexit? I don't know, but that's the answer. Yeah, that's probably not going to work. <laughs> Again, if you think you could do this, I guess give it a shot. I'd like to see you try. But if you do this, you're saying, I figured out the answer. I don't understand it. Nobody ever can, but this is it. All right. All right, with this contradictory, you're saying there's something without boundaries or definitions that explains all defined objects, but it cannot explain. Wait, what? <laughs> uh, here we have a direct contradiction even within the situation, even within the proposition, right? It says it can explain and it cannot explain. Okay, well, that, that's a direct contradiction. <laughs> now, maybe you want to say, well, it can't explain in one way, but it can explain in another. So, well, well, then no, that's not, a, that's not the proposition, right? Uh, and saying it cannot explain, you're saying it can't explain, period. So if you want to change it to say, well, it, can, cannot, it, it can't explain in one way, but it can't explain in another, you, you've changed the proposition. You're just trying to go for something else. And I guess that's fine, but you're not rejecting a premise that Annex and Menace has given us. So this premise, rejecting this premise, results in a logical contradiction. Uh, it's impossible. Well, I picked a really good spot to shoot video today. <laughs> so at this point, you might be a little frustrated and say, well, what's the right answer? I mean, it's one of these, right? It's one of these. Um, in, in fact, you know, these, these two answers are contrary. Either everything's composed of the finite or everything's composed of the infinite. They're contrary. They're also contradictory. They both can't be true and they both can't be false. So it's, I mean, it's one of these answers, right? I didn't say that the answer, the truth, would be easy. And I didn't say the truth would be, you know, problem-free, so to speak. <laughs> Either approach has this difficulty, right? Whether you think everything's composed of the infinite or composed of the finite. Either approach has this difficulty, and okay, 
And you can go either way. I, I guess that's your choice, right? Uh, well, let's not pretend that whichever way you go is problem free. Right? There's going to have to be some price. There's something you're going to have to answer or explain, right? especially to other people who disagree with you. And your task, then, <laughs> if you're going to try to answer the question, what does it mean to exist? Right? And if you're going to, you know, in answering that question, you're going to appeal to composition, right? Your task is to not only pay that price, but to somehow justify it, to provide evidence one way or the other, and even explain how you can make sense of the conclusions, of the consequences of your beliefs. Thank you.